question. How much do people know about real estate? Who actually, by show of hands, deals with real estate? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Not just HGTV. Um, who knows the definition of it? It's interesting because people think about property and buildings and land, but who thinks about it in the space and capacity world? Like the real estate on hard drive space or on a wall in an art space, what have you. I tend to start off with presentations. Um, if you don't know about me, you'll learn about it later in a presentation. But I'm the co-founder, executive director of uh, Sweetwater Foundation, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this is a mind game right now. There's too many words that people use without knowing what they are. Facts. And somehow facts don't matter anymore. So uh, we're trying to reclaim things that are relevant so we can actually ground the conversation. So real estate is the focus of this, um, reconstructing real estate. Prime example, what do you see? Vacant, Vacant lot. Space Absolutely. But depending on where we think it might be, it has this kind of mind game. So where do we see? Google Maps, June 2019. And I don't know if you can see it, but it says 57th Street in Chicago. Now the question is where? What do you think? Hmm? So empty lot. What is it? What could it be? This begins the debate of green versus sustainable. How many times do you hear people say green? It's green. We're going to be more sustainable about stuff. What does that mean? It's really passive. It actually doesn't mean anything. Um, people do, they think, oh, vacant lot, we could build a green building. Um, maybe. Um, vertical. Verticalization of space is a big thing, especially in cities, but you think about green buildings, but that's not in January in Chicago, February in Chicago. Um, that's interesting, but that's an enclosed utopia. Utopia is no place. That, I don't know what that is. Green wall, mega structure, it's interesting, but let's talk a little bit more specific. A lot of people talk about South Side Chicago, and they talk about food and food deserts and all this other conversation. They regurgitate stuff without knowing what that means. Um, is that food? To a degree, it's lettuce. It's pretty. It's indoors. But who is you, who's your audience and what's your price point? If you're doing only indoor controlled agriculture, and you don't have collards and kale and all the other stuff that is actually a, a healthy, balanced diet in areas that suffer from diabetes, hypertension, all types of health issues, and then that's not necessarily food, especially if your salad is $12. Just saying. Oh, plus your energy source. You're sub-optimizing the sun. Just saying. Then you get like buildings like these that are leads, you know, that's great to a degree. Solar panels is cool, uh, but it's a 30, 30 million plus expenditure. It becomes an isolated object in the architectural world that it celebrates itself. How does that affect the people that are suffering in those neighborhoods that need access to it? Who gets access to it? Then you have actual food, right? But then this is devalued. Um, it's not particularly celebrated. It's thought of as trivial as, oh, you got a garden, that's cute. Um, but the question is also, where do you do it? What's the soil? Is the soil safe? Where's your water source? All these practical questions. The reason I bring it up is, have anybody heard of impact investment? This is like the big thing. There's $12 trillion in this world. And it's all increasingly informed by data. What data is there? What are the metrics that are proving what's happening? And ESG is like environmental sustainable uh, government governance. SRI is um, socially responsible investment. These are things that are being informed that shape policy. But it's interesting, uh, the triple bottom line is people, planet, profit. There's keywords, paradigm, and in place. But we still got vacant lots. We got too many of them. 
where do you start? Can't start with a $30 million project for that, because where does that start? How do you start? So when you look at Google Maps a little bit more, because now people take virtual tours, they don't go there. In the planning world, you start to look and you say, all right, well, how long has it been vacant? We started the same exercise. 2011 is still vacant. What do you think the property value is? Yeah, why is it still vacant? It's eight years. Go back 2007 from an opposite view, from main steep, from like a main corridor looking at it, and you see a vacant building, you see a different demographic, and all of a sudden your subconscious plays, and then all of a sudden, so this is what's happening. There's a consciousness and a subconsciousness that we have to really process when we're thinking about space and, and property. This is the surrounding area. It's not as stable as one would hope. When you put it in the perspective of the media and what they talk about the south side of Chicago, foreclosures, crime, et cetera, et cetera, media just regurgitates, it, regurgitates this old story over and over and over again. The term that comes up is blight. Anybody know what that term is? You ever heard of urban blight, urban decay? It's actually a term from paleontology and the study of plants. It means the death and decay of a crop so that it no longer sustains life. It has become an economic devaluation tool to say that there's no value there. So when you say that it's a blighted community or blighted property, that's a really damning statement. And we throw that around like all the time without thinking about it. So now we got a blighted property on our hands. Hmm. Now the planning tools kick in. Let's break down all the variables, eliminate some stuff, just focus on the box. None of that other stuff. It's too much, too many variables. So that, that's the site that's highlighted. The grayed out area is actually public data um, where you can look at who owns what kind of public sector versus private and stuff. City owned parcels, highlighted in blue. It's a major footprint. Absentee, meaning people that don't live there pretty significant footprint. The ecology of absence is actually telling. Out of 174 parcels, 79% are vacant. 58% 50 are owned by the city, 24% are owned by the absentee, and only 9% are owned by the homeowners that live in the neighborhood. This kind of inverts the entire equation. What do you do with that? The city has, is at a loss, because where's your tax base? How do you support the schools? How do you support the, what's the housing tax? All types of stuff. How do you support the infrastructure? The zoning is interesting, because actually where this location is, this is public data. There's like this mysterious building there. If you know anything about the site, it's actually one of the worst schools in the history of Chicago. But it's not there, but it's in the zoning map today. It was demolished like mm, 2010, something like that. Um, there's, in, there's houses and parcels that are no longer there. But it's a weird mix of commercial zoning, residential zoning, and manufacturing. From a legacy from manufacturing used to be there from 1970. So what do you do with that? It wasn't always like this. We went back through the Sanborn maps and started looking a little bit more. Look at the density. Same site, same area. 1895, 1926. When you start to look a little bit closer, you piece history together. By 1930s, you have the Great Depression and you have the underwriting manual that explicitly says if a neighborhood is to retain a stability, any change of social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. This is the underwriting manual for the Federal Housing Authority. It explicitly says, on April 1st, 1936, if you change your demographic in a neighborhood, you're going to suffer in your values. This is a different era, but the, it lingers with us today. Correct? Very much so. Very much in Chicago. So, and Detroit, and Baltimore, and other major cities, right? But very much in Chicago. In 1949, a reconversion housing project was introduced to the same neighborhood. What the hell is a reconversion housing project? I know conversion housing projects because I study history, and World War II, 
there was a conversion housing effort in order to bring troops back home in order to get them housed. I don't know what a reconversion is, but this is interesting for coloreds. So we already talked about the neighborhood instability, and now you introduce a reconversion house for coloreds in that neighborhood. So, 1949, during the period when people were redlining, the Home Owning Loan Corporation decides to start saying these areas are red, these are hazardous, yellow's at risk, blue's okay. Now, in the map, this is Washington Park. Look at the difference. University of Chicago on this side, the red is deemed hazardous because of its population of Negroes. In the description. So it's deemed hazardous that's a threat to this other neighborhood and it's been redlined. 2012, that's what you got. See how the population just kind of hollowed out? The vacancy emerged, did not happen overnight. Food deserts is a short-sighted conversation because when you're told you won't get your money back in that neighborhood, why would you put any amenity in there until it's incentivized, until it's gentrified, until it's new for the development? So this is weird. In Inglewood, Washington Park, or wherever, there's all this weird valuation that ranges from 5000 to 250000 for a vacant lot. Based on what? How do you determine that? So this question of value keeps popping up. There's an active process of valuing, which is kind of reductive, which is only about money and numbers. But then there's a value in principle and what you're supposed to do that's right. And we don't always do the right thing. We do what's based on money sometimes. The concept of redlining has stayed with us. It lives with us to this day. It also is something we're plagued by. It's trending. It's also very popular in the art world and all types of stuff. It's very much trending. I don't quite, sh I don't really understand why it's trending the way it is. Um, Cause it's a, but it, I'm glad it's a healthy conversation and we need to have the right conversation. We forget in the same neighborhoods between 1950 to 19, in 1960s, $3.2 billion was extracted from the same neighborhoods. So it's not about just that reductive conversation because there is a thing called root shock. When you're displaced and you're replaced and you're displaced and you're replaced and you're displaced and you have nowhere to go over generations, it actually affects things. Question about the, that is a very hazardous process. It lets whatever's in that building into the air. It affects air quality. We have air sensors. We should be documenting this. The soil is further contaminated. So you have lead in the soil, metals in the soil, in the same neighborhoods where the kids are supposed to be playing and eating and doing all types of stuff. Lead in the water. If you really think about this, this is affecting brain development. This affects neuroplasticity over time how you learn, how you behave, all types of stuff. So we got a vacant lot that's blighted. It's a not all that negative though, because Sweetwater Foundation, I'm the co-founder, our team, some of our team is there. Our, our tagline is, there grows a neighborhood. We actually are in this area. We practice a focus on regenerative neighborhood development, and it really is biologically inspired, and we think about like the ecology of place. How do you make a safe and healthy place, realistically, intergenerational? Uh, and I'll show you actual things and images. But we focus on regeneration, not degeneration. If you over-tech control everything, you're, not, you're sub optimizing your natural biodiversity, it actually starts to become degenerative. Because the money is just sunk into it. If you don't have a healthy balance in it, you're not understanding, you're not evolving. So we operate in what we call the third sector. I think a lot of people here dabble between both worlds, public and private sector, um, where, where the social economy happens. And this is interesting. That you know, simple Venn diagram does sum up like nonprofits, entrepreneurs, the Airbnbs and the lifts and all that stuff is in that world. So we do a little bit of architecture, aquaponics, agriculture, a, little, a lot of messy stuff to agitate the system. Chaos theory that's applied in order to shift it a little bit. So when you have a foreclosed house and a property, what's the value of it? Especially when it was built in 2007 and put on the market for $460,000 in Washington Park and Englewood when the bubble was bursting. 
don't really make sense. You just tore down Robert Taylor a couple blocks away. We turned it into that. It's illogical. It doesn't make economic sense. Appreciate that. Um, we turned it into a place, from an empty space to a place, through garden, through education, through design, through mural, through art, and it functions as a community school. I mean, literally. How many field trips do we have this week? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's great, because when you go outside, now these are obviously in the spring, summer, what have you, these pictures, but we have stuff growing inside right now, in hoop houses, indoors, inside the house. So it still functions like that. Um, that's a great echo when you go through a, a, a space like that and you go outside, you get some collard greens and you get to plant some stuff and harvest and take it home to the family and then tell the family to come back. That's great. Doesn't register as economically viable though. Open to the public. What does that mean? It means people can come get food. They give back. They give back time and they give back donations. They give back what they can. Um, but the fact that you can actually experience broccoli first person and sunflowers and you can share with your family, that's love. That's love. Love is not appreciated. It's not valued. That's humanity. It becomes a safe space where kids can come and play. You can experience like lemon cucumbers. People don't know what that is. You should come see it. Um, fresh produce and vegetables, intergenerational dynamics in farmers markets, all that lo grown locally, eggplants, zucchini, squash, watermelon, everything. But the ecology of the place, this invisible thing starts to transform. Now all of a sudden you got sunflowers, you got bees, you got solitary bees, we got honeybees, we got butterflies, all types of crickets, praying mantis, aphids, you know, ladybugs, everybody's playing together eating each other. Um, it becomes a community farm that is, it operates totally different from the norm of everything else we are used to and conditioned to think about in the south side of Chicago or the west side. Our norm, we have people from the neighborhood, we have people from outside the neighborhood, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, Harvard, whatever, University of Chicago, whatever you do, just get to work. We're here together, we're here to work and play together, we celebrate the food that we grow, we introduce people to make them feel human again. Um, so when a chef comes in and says, I can cook, but then one of the people in our network says, I wanna learn how to cook, or I have a twist on a recipe, then you're both in the same space. <clears throat> Mama Betty is Mama Betty. Um, she's culture, she is wisdom. She fills a family void for folks that don't have that family. Um, but the space of the kitchen becomes the classroom. The living room is a living room. The basement is a tinkering space, is a maker space, is a sharing space. The whole thing is like think, do, think, do. It's called the think, do house. If you Google right now, think, do house on Google Maps, it takes you right there in the social economy. You don't have to worry about the address. It's a printmaking space for kids to explore biometrics and you know, biodiversity through art. For adults to do the same thing. Make t-shirts, we made this t-shirt in the basement. Creating spaces for humans to meet and play and then you can have squash blossoms and okra blossoms and all types of great stuff and make it real sexy and have it feel good, taste good, but it's not $1,000 a plate. If you offer $1,000 for the plate, we will very much put it back into the program and support the operations. Now, <laughs> don't get it twisted. <clears throat> the greenhouse that you see optically that is a temporary structure is actually functionally a wood shop, open to the neighborhood. We invite folks for, public, for private workshops with a team and in public demonstrations and workshops to take repurposed wood from the waste stream of the city. What I mean by that, city of glass, glass everywhere. It's usually delivered uh, and once the glass is delivered, it's delivered in wood, it's taken by waste management. The crates, 
the, the pallets, everything is discarded. So instead we get it, we clean it, and then turn it back into public use for public space. So we come up with ideas and design objects, hand draw them, high school kids, learn how to do it in SketchUp, sketch up, open source it, go to Rhino, you know, perfect it, and then we implement it. So we de-genderize tools, flip the space, make a product. It's a crate out of a crate. But it's a human infrastructure and physical infrastructure at the same time. So that's like a product that goes to market. And then we come up with different design ideas and share them and network them. And then we have mentors that work with our urban ecology apprentices. Names do matter, titles matter to a degree, but they also change. So when the place begins to transform and the spaces are being are cultivated, that's the work shop, get it? Work in your shop. So we can swipe, because we're Wi-Fi. People got phones, use them. So you have these products that become lesson plans. So this is like the reciprocal engagement of knowledge and information that goes back and forth. It's like, oh, it becomes a lesson plan. Oh, it's, less, uh, you know, it's an actual product, but then it gets refined and it actually gets, actually, knowledge gets generated. So when we have this space of drawing and products out of this wasted wood, let me go back. Um, claiming public space, because even though that vacant lot was empty for how long, now it's actually public space. I didn't say it's like publicly owned, it's just public space. It's been like 20 years. So we designed a barn, first timber frame barn in the city of Chicago since the fire. Hand raised it as a block party because it's a pe place for people. Okay. We have annual events. We have Juneteenth celebration of freedom on June 20th. We invite you to come through, meet people, have some good food, play. It's a block party style. But it becomes a tourist destination point where like a 5.0 business on Google Maps. Lots of people show up. Cultural heritage is preserved and shared and, and memories are formed. Right? We can talk about our lineage. We can talk about place. We can talk about sound and what it does to the brain waves. We can talk about encoding new memories. We, this magic phenomenon happens in the summer when the sunflowers just come up and all the beautiful rows we had done all this work for just didn't disappear because the sunflowers everywhere. We have 10,000 sunflowers, but we encourage you to come to that experience. You get lost in the city of Chicago and some sunflowers over some good food. Mama Betty, throw down. Um, so when you have that kind of experience, this is liminality at work. This is the dream in between space where we get to think about space and place totally different than anything you ever probably experienced. That's a wonder. <clears throat> so what's interesting is that this, this we call it the Thought Barn. When you go inside the Thought Barn, we have international puppet shows, we have all this stuff that happens, community sing events, yoga. You get it, right? Lots of things happen, it's very dynamic. That's the puppet show, that's wood. When you have a community meeting in that way and a participatory engagement that really generates new data that is not public information, because people don't know what the information is, we're generating it. Um, nighttime events, with, you know, High Park Jazz Festival, that's what this is. That's actually a sunflower from on the site, but this is regeneration at work. Every one of these patterns and designs is a seed that's being, that emerges and forms and drops and plants. If you look very carefully, you'll see bees at work. There's tons of pollen. But that's what our work is about. So when you go back to that vacant lot, what is missed in data, in the taxes, and everything else, what is missed is on that same vacant lot, we run 90% of the area. So. We get to work, we do the mowing, the land, that's called landscaping. <laughs> These words matter. What happens when landscaping includes urban agriculture? Because it was illegal until 2012. Um, we introduce new designs, because we can and we know how to. 
And when we started to do an installation for the Chicago Architecture Biennial, on our site first, publicly, is a public art installation and sculpture to talk about timber frames like the barn. And we do a hand raising that the community in the area comes through and we hand raise a structure that moves <coughs> and slides. People ask questions like, what is it? Well, what do you want it to be? Let's get some feedback. It's a sculpture right now, but now it's also a, it's a place. We call it the R&D house, Regenerative Neighborhood Development House. It's a prototype for another type of, it could be a art studio, it could be a house, a tiny house, move beyond tiny house, it's a modular house. But then when it goes down to the architecture biennial and the cultural center, the neighborhood, it's like, what happened to, what, what happened? Why is it not here anymore? We get to work, so Sam, Danny, some of the team, we conceptualize a new structure that becomes a, like a fractal and goes out into the space and transform. We play with fire chart, transform the beauty of the wood into, you know, Shosuke Bond and all the HGG, HGTV trends, right? Um, but this is real. We transform the space in public space, transform work to make it visible. We have a modular design that we just hand raised. In the process of hand raising, we lost a member of our network. So we had a memorial to celebrate Aaron's life. And then Monday happened and we got back to work. Building upon the memory and the legacy. And we have these really interesting moments where the space is completely transformed because this sculpture is going up. And we call it the meeting house. Because that's what you're supposed to do in politics. You're supposed to meet and actually be productive and move, do stuff that fixes the situation, you're supposed to. So we have the meeting house, but we dare to dream about what it can become. It's not finished. So in that same empty space, this lives, ready to become a garden center, ready to become a public space that needs to be whatever it needs to be in the neighborhood, but we're introducing housing to the conversation. We are going to hand raise housing in the same way you can do the block party, you can introduce new sculptures and new houses, right? Um, but the, most, of the air, most of the area, the, the, when we did the, went down the data information, we found that most of the housing stock is from 1860 to 1907 in our area. It's good housing stock. It's actually the worker cottages. Most people don't know about the Chicago, this is the first affordable housing in Chicago, the worker cottage. So we're going to revisit it in what we call the commons today, but we're introducing the commonwealth because we want to question what is that? What is wealth collectively for everybody? Um, so we have a, a plan that will change over time, but it's introducing housing to the neighborhood the right way as a community land trust that can, has the potential to branch out, right? Across 10 or 20 blocks, we don't know. This is important though, not just building new, but it's also rehabilitating the existing. Because how often do you get to live in existing poverty and actually invest back into your property? You usually have to make a choice on, do I feed somebody? Do I pay a bill? Um, poverty is a big topic that I think is misunderstood. There's lots of meetings and there's a summit, poverty summit happening about all this stuff, but that, like, this is a concrete, real solution to fixing conceptual framework of poverty. But I feel like people miss the point where they don't really talk about this. So when we talk about see, touch, taste, hear, smell, it is what is informing the structures of our consciousness. I think about things, I can touch it, I can experience it, I can do it again, I can share it, I can teach it. Um, but it's interesting because this is, the big data thing scares me a little bit because it misses all this valuable information. And it creates these utopian fantasies. So I'm going to let Frederick Douglass speak on my behalf, where he said, it is the picture of life, that image, utopian fantasy, contrasted with the fact of life and the ideal contrasted with the, with the real, which makes criticism possible. Where there is no criticism, there is no progress. So if we're just rendering kind of policies, if we're rendering kind of ideas and rendering vi visions of stuff that isn't real, we further the problem. So with that, 
we're here to say there grows the neighborhood very realistically. Um, it was really interesting to come into this space because um, Derek played a major part in rethinking data in the city, but also the, the large lot initiative. I'm very familiar with it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's great because it starts the conversation of shifting ownership to residents. Um, there was a challenge in how do you implement that practically, realistically. And um, there was also this, this map um, called, what was it? Uh, what was that the initiative he did? The million dollar blocks. Yeah, Chicago million dollar blocks. So one of the groups that I went to school with, they did in Columbia, they did this million dollar blocks in New York. Um, and it was interesting because what it did, it, 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 it thought about like, where is the dollars that are spent um, to support where people have been incarcerated? And um, there's public dollars that get concentrated into one block that are a million dollars plus. And I didn't really call it out on the slide, but $2.79 million uh, goes to support people that used to be at a homeless shelter, that used to be the school, and mostly school for social reform, that's now our farm. So, but what's problematic about it is that it, once you put that onto a map and it just looks red, then people are like, oh, it's a justification that why you want to erase that and why people shouldn't go there. But we challenge that and we say we got to rethink the data, we got to rethink investment strategies. And um, yeah, I'm here, here, here to take some questions that we can play. Uh, so it's a comment slash question. Are you familiar with the phrase herbs in Horto? Yeah, our motto, yeah, city exactly. in a garden. I'm, I'm glad that that is your motto. For those of you that don't know, uh, the Latin phrase herbs in Horto is a phrase that was uh, crafted by the Chicago Park District, if I'm not mistaken, in the mid-1800s, right. which means city in a garden, yep. uh, which actually it was kind of the motto that the city used to spearhead a lot of their public uh, parks projects, like the boulevards that collect that connect a lot of the parks together and all of the parks that we enjoy. Um, and I just want to say thank you for being an embodiment of that mission. Well, thank you. Wait, wait, wait. Do you know what their operational budget is per year? Uh, I'd love to know. 2.7, well, sorry, half of 1%. I don't know what the total figure is. I don't want to call that like that, but half of 1%, half of 1% is around 2.4 million annual. For the Parks District? Yeah, so just to think about other possible avenues, if we had half of 1% of the operational budget, because we technically are helping public space, park engagement, what have you, as a partnership, ironically, a lot with Parks District today. They bring programming to us, we support the parks, a lot of the dance floors and stuff we've done have gone to five separate public parks. So it's just a way to rethink about utilizations of dollars in a very, very like synergistic way that publicly helps everybody. Thanks. So how do you um, cultivate the human uh, interaction around the place? Well, I guess my question is really, um, how do people who want to get involved, how do they find their path once they arrive? So this is going to seem antithetical. When an email shows up, it hits like five of us, and we do our best to get a response. Right, Courtney? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we do our best is like, please, if you can, or in the contact, you know, info at sweetwaterfoundation.com, or if you contact on the website, this thing comes in. It's kind of, this is going to go back to the brain science again. Um, it's like our central nervous system. This email thing that comes in is people say like, I'm a data scientist, I'm a teacher, I'm a whatever, I'm a gardener, I'm a builder. We get these understanding and translations that happen from the emails. And then we get this acceleration of if you actually physically show up, there's a degree of commitment and we get to humanize and to put a face to the name. So I take pictures of any and everything because it helps me remember everything. 
it also humanizes the person and the individual so that the network knows who that person is. And then with a rhythm and occurrence where somebody shows up on a regular basis, and then they start to get really you know, in tune with the people and the place, then I don't think life happens. So we encourage people to show up. We have volunteer days. There will be a number of them coming up. There's also the web on the, there's a newsletter on the website. Um, donations are always welcome because usually if it hits Squarespace, it hits us. And we have this, again, emails. It's, it's this really interesting database of humans. Um, but the more people show up, the more regular, the more frequent, the more life kind of gets cultivated together, the more we know what we can do together. Thanks for the presentation. Um, what's next and how do you think data can help? Um, so again, we, uh, well, what's next is we would happily host a hackathon. Just to put it out there. A hackathon of the Thought Barn sounds like, Thought Barn sounds like the thing of 2020. Um, we have a slew of information that we're trying to go through and parse through. Like for instance, demolition lists are public data. TIF dollars, everybody know what TIFs are? Tax incremental finance are public data. Um, the neighborhood opportunity fund is a residual that kind of after the TIF, you know. We would really like to understand what's happening. It just so happens, I think the last time I looked, we were in a $42 million TIF area. Something to think about. Um, we, in the previous administration, weren't necessarily considered economic development. So we didn't fit. We are doing housing. That's the next frontier. Like the, the next wave is definitely housing um, because we have a population and audience is also data. The majority of our population that we work with, 16 to 26, 28, um, if you make minimum wage in the city of Chicago, you are pretty like damned to be slumlorded with housing. You're almost condemned to never become a house owner. You will not become a homeowner. And we're not paying attention to that reality. So that definitely impacts how we live, what we can do, how we raise our children, especially when you close the schools in the same neighborhoods. So we're, we're, we're looking through demolition information, t t TIF dollars, just to understand um, resource allocation. But then also, how could it be, this is not like, this is a reconciliatory moment for the city and for everybody else. It's like this, how can we do things a little bit differently that's more productive for everybody, right? I don't care politics, I don't care about none of that. I mean, I do, but we gotta work through it. One awesome work that you're doing, but wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about going back to when you founded it, what inspired you, what was your vision, and how is that, how does it align with what it is today, and then I have a second part question, but maybe I should. Yeah. What's the second part? Second part. I think I can remember uh, it. What are you, what's your current like, main sources of funding, and mm -hmm. how do you see that evolving over time as you build the organization further? Part of it goes hand in hand. So 2000, well, I, you, can, you can applaud for this. We're a decade old. <laughs> that means we've figured some things out. Um, we started off, when I say we, I constantly say we. I guess because I'm, uh, I don't know, I just feel like I can't do this. You, you can't do the work like this alone. And that's, that's, a, that's just bull, yeah. Um, social engaged practice rely, re, re, relies on the collectivity. And, and so we um, have been doing this work for a decade. And when I co-founded the organization with a community roofer, who's an older individual, it looks like the reincarnate of Mark, uh, Albert, Twain, uh, uh, Albert Einstein and Mark Twain, um, people looked at us like, how the hell did this happen? They're like, don't worry about it. Uh, we started off with work in the classroom of schools that were being undervalued. We started doing hydroponics and aquaponics in closed off areas. So you could activate a space like this in a heartbeat and turn it into a living learning laboratory. 
So it started off with STEM and STEAM, agitating the STEM conversation, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we were like, what about agriculture, architecture, arts? We called it A plus with a bracket. STEAM, steaming the 21st century of power. Um, so we went from that small scale project and honestly was starting to hack the system, hacking the CPS realm or actually between Chicago Public Schools and Milwaukee Public Schools. We were like, we don't have m money and resources, but we have assets and we have different types of resources, not just money. We have teachers that are dedicated, we have students that are dedicated, they're written off, and we want to start a project with what we can. So so-and-so might have a friend who, or, or, or an uncle might, or an aunt might be a plumber or electrician or something else. So we start a small-scale project and scale it up. But unfortunately, the school would close. Or something would happen within the network. So we, once we got asked to be at that site, in the farm site, we just basically started translating it. So all of that you saw was from 2014. That was just 2014. Um, so founded it in that way. Like this, the term blight, just cross the B out, focus on the light. So this is a wordplay, little mini hacks along the way that just culminate into something that fractalizes humanity. Y'all know what a fractal is? Geometric shape and pattern that scales up and you know, um, just fractalizing humanity over and over and over and over again as best you can to trying to figure out like what can practically be done. Um, so. Basically, there's no excuse for y'all not to be participating. All right. All right, one, I think we have time for one more question. Did I answer the second question? What about now and moving forward? Now moving forward is you're about to do that next. Um, we, are, we are scaling up. I mean, I'm not gonna go too much into this, but who knows about opportunity zones? So opportunity zones is a convenient development flip it's a federal tax policy where you have capital gains and you don't pay any, you take your capital gains and you put it into an area and you don't pay taxes for 10 years. That is happening right now. We're in an opportunity zone. There is an opportunity to have a fun site to do this type of development, but we keep getting it wrong. So the last one that just got pressed around, it was like, I think they, they're doing an opportunity, it's, an, it's a housing development, in Pilsen or somewhere, um, 200 and, 202 units, but seven are affordable housing. And then there's a, a question of how long they'll be affordable. So like we are in an opportunity zone. So one of the reasons we're talking about data usage and understanding like what are the demolitions in the area? What's actually happening? What's the public data that can support doing things a little bit better, more honest, more accountable? Um, is because for a fraction of that cost, we can actually do housing and have it be really affordable with this team in the network and whoever else comes into this equation. So that's what's next, 10 block neighborhood development. Yep. If we wanted to volunteer our time for this, what's the best way to get involved? There are volunteer days. Increasingly, as it gets warmer and more hands are needed we always need hands to weed. It's a great place to talk to somebody. You can learn, you can share, but also harvesting. There are, we have like an international puppet show that does events. Um, it's pretty wild, like watching the space transform and the kids transform, and then the adults are, they get lost in the puppets. It's awesome. Um, on our website, if you go on the, newsletter, sign up for the newsletter. There is an events in category where we have a public event. If you, even if you don't want to just volunteer just yet, you want to fill this out. Um, if you want to and you have the time, come by and do a tour. Just let us know. Um, ideally, if it's a larger group, we want to schedule that like properly because it affects work getting done. Um, but yeah, come in for a tour, come by, say hello. Tell the team that you appreciate them. <laughs>